Good afternoon and welcome to our highly anticipated first roundtable of this season. From the, NEA, from the WPA to the NEA, arts funding then and now. And now is the operative word for arts organizations like our own. Um, and before we begin this afternoon's event, uh, I have some announcements about up-and-coming Philotetes events. I should say emergency announcements, because great ideas like are have an emergency-type nature. And um, first, I'd like to say about the art exhibit you see on the walls, it was curated by Hallie Cohn with the help of Adam Ludwig. It's called Art in the Public Eye. All of our art exhibits here at Philip Teddy's are tied into round tables. And this particular one deals with the whole subject of public art, which was something that was particularly got its seminal kind of impetus during the WPA. And to that end, we uh, are the posters that Janine Menlove did on that wall are for sale after the show for $10 each. So these are posters that are based upon WPA-type concepts. And you'll notice kind of the Bauhaus typography and ideas like this. And that many of the artists that were involved in the WPA mural program were, not many of them, but some of them were European immigrants. And that the typography that you see here was influenced by styles that had been brought over by some of these artists who had immigrated to the States during the Depression. Um, tomorrow, September 26th, our improvisational jazz series continues at Philip Tatey's with Jane Ira Bloom heading up a discussion and performance uh, dedicated to the theme of jazz and the visual impulse. Now, this is kind of a synesthesia type idea. And Vicky Barenke, who is an artist, and the Uruguayan pianist Gustav Casanevi will join a panel that includes Rebecca Allen, who's an artist and curator, and Marty Ehrlich, the clarinetist, and, of course, Jane Ira Bloom, who's performed here many times, is a magnificent soprano jazz saxophonist. And what we're doing here is, is dealing with the relationship between painting and music. Uh, Jane, a number of years ago, did a uh, CD uh, called Chasing Paint, which was inspired by Pollock. And it's out of that it's first attempt that this panel sort of generated. And during at tomorrow's event... Uh, Vicky Barenke will actually be painting and there will be an improvisational relationship with the music and the painting going on which poses certain cleaning problems for us <laughs> on October 2nd we return to two subjects that are very much a part of our mission when we present the round table psychoanalysis and neuroscience 10 years later Heather Berlin and Christina Alberini both neuroscientists at Mount Sinai will appear along with Vittorio Galese of the University of Parma Famed for his work with mirror neurons, Donald Pfaff from the Neurobiology Lab at Rockefeller, and Mark Solms, the chair of neuropsychology at the University of Cape Town, and a prominent figure in the fields of psychoanalysis, neuroscience, and neuropsychoanalysis. Now, we have another event. Ed, on the Marie Ponceau event, do we have a date on that yet? We have, there, you may have read in that we do have it scheduled. We, uh, the, the poet Marie Ponceau has performed and read her poetry many times, been on panels at Philotetes, and you may have read in the Times that she had had a stroke last year. She proposed a panel dealing with the pathology that resulted from the stroke. I think there, were, there was intermittent aphasia, and there was, uh, she's still writing poetry, but she's been impaired. So we have a panel composed of poets and neuroscientists that she's kind of leading, leading. And uh, we'll be, it's, it's something that Oliver Sacks wrote about in an issue of The New Yorker about three or four months ago in another case of a writer who had had a stroke and whose ability to write had been impaired by the stroke, but he's still, in other words, he can't speak, but he can write. So it's an interesting kind of subject. On October 4th, our, this season's film series begins with Working with Pinter, a film directed by Pinter actor Harry Burton, and Mr. Burton will also be present for a discussion following the film. Now, consult our calendar for up-and-coming programs on the origins, not the birth of tragedy, on October 16th, Hamlet on October 30th, and Finding Equilibrium in Vertigo, November 6th. Uh, we will be showing the film Vertigo in conjunction with that, that panel. Along with jazz, our poetry series continues on October 19th with Wallace Stevens' Words That 
matter. And if you go to philiptades.org, all of our programs are calendared. They're all archived and appear on YouTube, and they're simulcast. So like what, you're, what we're doing here today, if you go to philiptades.org, you can see it. Um, and lastly, we depend on you for support. Uh, we recently came to the bottom of the barrel and got a check in the mail from an anonymous donor, and we're in, we're in business. But we're, it's a day-to-day. -day. Keeping Philip Tatis alive is a day-to-day -day struggle, and we're very thankful to the DCA, in fact, and other arts, arts, arts funding, government arts funding organizations for allowing us to survive. But we need your support. We need support of our following in order to keep our programs going. And now I'm very pleased to introduce Mars Dickstein. Morris Dickstein is the author of Dancing in the Dark, A Cultural History of the Great Depression. He is Distinguished Professor of English and Theater at CUNY Graduate Center and the author of Gates of Eden and Leopards in the Temple, amongst other works. Morris Dickstein will moderate this afternoon's panel and introduce our other distinguished guests. So take it away, Morris. Thank you. Uh, now, I was asked to introduce this program uh, with these distinguished panelists, most of whom know a lot more about the subject than I do, but just let me come up with a few remarks, some of which may lead to discussion, others of which may not. Uh, the obvi obviously, arts funding is a crucial issue today. More cru it's always a crucial issue, but it's more crucial, of course, because of uh, the recession and cutbacks that have already begun and other cutbacks that we can surely anticipate. Uh, we all know that the arts are tended to be, in terms of any public budgets and some private budgets as well, the arts tend to be a somewhat soft spot, uh, a place that looks easy to cut. Uh, it's not only sensitive to shrinking and uh, catastrophically critical government budgets at every level uh, of government, but also sensitive <coughs> to <coughs> the... Um, the, the fate of private incomes uh, and the laws, of course, that also give tax breaks for philanthrop philanthropic contributions uh, to the arts. And I think that we can expect, and certainly in a worst-case scenario, that the arts to be in a on a starvation diet uh, in, the, uh, in, in the near future. Um, the, uh, uh, it's wonderful to have... Uh, uh, Rocco Landisman here from the National Endowment for the Arts. Uh, the, uh, we all know about the uh, critical issues that surrounded, the kind of the controversies that surrounded the endowments, in the, especially in the early 90s at the height of the culture wars. Those have, have now uh, fortunately died down. But they haven't really gone away. The political uh, and partisan battles over the arts certainly have not completely gone away. Uh, we saw it uh, a year ago, February, when uh, in the stimulus bill that President Obama had proposed, a, a, a tiny, tiny amount of uh, $50 million for the National Endowment for the Arts uh, that was targeted simply, strictly to save jobs uh, became, though, represented probably 0.01% of the entire stimulus bill, or 0.0001% of the stimulus bill, became such a heated uh, source of controversy that an actual resolution was passed uh, in the Senate to remove it, uh, along with uh, other things that were categorized with it, such as swimming pools, parks, recreations, and so on. Uh, uh, and and uh, miraculously, that was saved in uh, in conference in the final bill that emerged. But I think it indicated the degree, the political pressures that the arts, uh, certainly uh, at the at the federal level, that the arts are under. Now, in response to the arguments against the arts and to the perception that the arts are a soft part of the budget. Uh, the usual defense, both last year and, and at other times, have been basically the economic defense, as we see at a local level, we see it uh, nationally as well. The, the benefits to business, to tourism, uh, dollar amounts have been put on the, uh, the contributions to the economy of the arts and in uh, local areas and cities and so on. Uh, now, some of this, I think, much of this, of course, is true and, have, and has been proved fairly effective. Uh, some of it is tongue-in-cheek because it's often made by people whose deeper belief is that the, the, the real value of the arts is not strictly economic or touristic, but it is, you might even put an unfashionable word spiritual on it, that the arts 
you know, illuminate the human condition, that the arts provide a deep area of satisfaction, uh, provide something to their audience and something to every, every individual and to our society as a whole, but cannot be gotten otherwise, a sense of tradition, a sense of national culture, uh, reflections on deeper, even metaphysical issues uh, having to do with the, uh, the, the fate of the human being as well as social issues. Uh, the, uh, the, the, the preservation of our humanistic heritage and so on. I don't have to go through all this. Uh, uh, but uh, I think that most defenders of public funding for the arts have settled on the economic case, and I suppose that that's, uh, that's a good thing uh, to people who can only, be, can only be appealed to on such an economic basis. Now, we look back, as the, as the title of this forum indicates, we look back to the 1930s as a, a kind of golden age for government sponsorship of the arts. And I think that when we do that, we forget how anomalous the situation of the 1930s was. Uh, one, uh, one line that's gone around uh, a lot in the last year or two has been, you know, don't let any crisis go to waste. And, and certainly uh, the whole notion of the 100 days and the, 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 the remarkable... Hat trick, the remarkable thing that FDR and the New Deal pulled off, which was simultaneously to rev up the sense of crisis, which was great enough already when, in 1933, but at the same time provide uh, some reassurance that the crisis could be handled and that we could deal with it and we could survive it. Uh, that crisis led to uh, the formulation uh, of, of uh, you know, and, and of course the huge Majorities that Roosevelt gradually built up in the United States Congress uh, enabled the arts programs to go through, though, though we tend to forget how controversial they were, that the controversies of, the, of recent years are in many ways uh, less than the controversies around the arts programs, uh, especially the WPA, in, in the 1930s until the WPA was finally killed uh, in the late 30s and early 40s. Um, now, uh, I, I think that uh, we also forget, uh, most of us who are not concerned professionally with the culture of the 1930s, forget how complex and varied the New Deal arts programs were. Uh, in the title of this uh, roundtable, we, we mentioned the WPA, but of course the WPA was only one of a number of different arts programs, uh, some of which are in fact uh, in their own terms, better remembered than the WPA, though I think the public vaguely associates them with the WPA. Perhaps the best known were, uh, and, and the, probably the most powerful survivors, the most powerful residue of the 30s arts programs were, those, were the work of the photographers. Uh, and uh, they worked uh, you know, under, in the photography unit of the uh, Farm Security Administration under the Department of Agriculture, and they were only probably, give or take, a little more than a dozen photographers uh, associated with this program. Was Walker Evans one of those? And Walker Evans was one of those. Some, they were all young and relatively unknown. Walker Evans was not quite unknown. But of course, uh, half or three quarters of them became among the most famous photographers, most celebrated photographers in American history, including Walker Evans, Dorothea Lange, and, 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 uh, uh, and, and several others. Uh, and uh, although they were, they were few in number, uh, they produced uh, an extraordinarily large and varied body of work. Uh, when I was looking for illustrations for my book, it was just, uh, it was a perfect moment because by that point, all of the, the whole archive of the, WP, of the, uh, of the of photographer's uh, work had gone online on the, libra the uh, Library of Congress website. And... Uh, and it was an amazing uh, wealth of, 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 uh, of material to, 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 to go through and to choose from. On the other hand, it's important to remember that this was not at the time considered in any way an arts program. This was considered uh, a form of, of uh, an informational program, a form of documentation. The political logic of the photographers were, was simply to document primarily rural poverty uh, at the behest of the Department of Agriculture, in part because FDR and uh, his associates felt that 
uh, urban uh, voters, or, you know, or, you know uh, urban America, could not really understand how people could actually be starving in rural areas. After all, well, the cotton may have failed, but they could always raise their own food. Well, they c- couldn't if they were, if they were migrant farmers or uh, tenant farmers who were forced off the land and so on. Uh, and so, uh, and now it happened that because of the social crisis, the uh, documentation and, even, and journalism were very, very close to the mainstream of the arts in the 1930s. So it wasn't, in fact, a great leap from the documentary impulse of the photographic unit to the sense that we had miraculously uh, 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 produced an extraordinary body of art. The other program that's uh, quite well known, but also sometimes vaguely associated with the WPA, which with, with which it had no connection, was the commissions to artists to decorate public buildings. And this was something that was under the Treasury Department. Uh, it, in, in the end, uh, they, they decorated 1,100 post offices and other public buildings. And uh, and uh, left many of those have been destroyed. Some, a few have been restored. Uh, this also left behind a very important body of work. You could say that if the WPA and other agencies helped create the infrastructure of America that is now rotting and decaying, uh, that the, uh, the, the, the Treasury Department and the WPA created what you might call an artistic infrastructure uh, uh, in ways that were, were were important for America at the time. Um, um, just, well, just wonder, we have a short period of time because like, Rocco in particular has to leave. Sure. So, right? so we, and we do need to okay. reserve this if we could make it a little bit shorter. I'll, I'll, to I'll, to I'll speed up. Thank you. Thank you. The WPA, of course, was the, is the program that we'll be primarily talking about today. Uh, and I think one of the important things to remember about the WPA program that makes it strikingly different from the other programs that it was Again, not strictly an arts program. First of all, the WPA produced, you know, was in many ways a construction program. The, the construction worker, although there were other programs, the construction worker was the model that they vaguely tried to apply to the, to the, arts, to the arts programs. Uh, but the thing that they shared was that they were both re- they were relief programs. In other words, you had to show that you were destitute. Uh, in order to qualify as an artist or as anyone else working for the WPA. The, the, some of the programs did allow up to 10% of hired help who were not on relief in order to help follow through with these programs. But largely, uh, if, if we had more time, I, would, uh, I was going to read the testimony of somebody who went through the hoops in order to prove that he had absolutely no money, he had no food in his refrigerator, that he had no family that could take care of him, he had nothing in his bank account, he had nothing that he was really destitute enough to qualify for the $23.86 a week that he would get on the WPA. Uh, but the fact that, that it was a relief program uh, uh, did not mean that it was not tremendously important turning point for the, for the arts in America and for the public support of the arts. Uh, uh, the, uh, the, it, 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 it was the first time that many artists were able to actually work full time on their art. It gave them a sense of professionalism. It gave them a sense of, uh, of working together. It gave them a sense of a mission. It also, of course, contributed tremendously, along with the Treasury Department murals, to something that was hugely important in the culture of the 30s, which was the fact that America, in this economic and social crisis, began to look inward, not inward just personally and psychologically, but inward culturally, to try to take stock of themes, historical elements, strengths, weaknesses within American culture that would enable this country to survive the Depression and therefore contributed to the growth not only of the individual identity of artists, but to the... uh, to the, the sense of national identity. I think the existence of a national culture in America fundamentally arises in the 1930s. What we, th- what we simply take for granted, uh, it had partly to do with the creation of the new electronic media that made uh, an electro- a, a national culture technologically possible, but it also had to do with these programs that were in many ways oriented towards local as well as national and historical themes in American life that gave... <coughs> The, this country, a sense of uh, that, that we had a national culture. 
Now we That's have a good place to start right there not now, maybe. We will. Uh, I, what I'd like to do now, <laughs> uh, uh, what I'd like to do now is to, I, I think each of our speakers tonight, uh, today, has uh, comes from you might say a different part of the terrain, uh, and um, and uh, I mean it's it would be nice if we could also have had a, a panel with someone from a foundation, a business person who was involved in support for the arts, uh, and so on and so forth. But what we have here is very complicated and very varied, uh, and uh, you know let me introduce the participants in alphabetical order. Uh, Rocco Landisman is, as your program says, the 10th chairman of the National uh, Endowment for the Arts. He, uh, uh, he also comes from the other side of the field, the commercial side of the arts. He has a doctorate in dramatic literature from Yale. I uh, taught at Yale. Uh, and, uh, but he also was one of the best known and most respected producers uh, on Broadway as the head of the Jamson Theaters. And, uh, so I think that he can speak from both or even, in fact, several sides of the equation of the funding and the, uh, of the arts. Uh, Kate, Le- uh, Kate Levin, whom uh, I know from an earlier life when we were both uh, running humanity centers at CUNY, uh, uh, has been for qu- quite some time the c- uh, commissioner of the Department of Cultural F- Affairs uh, of New York City. And uh, this, is, this current administration, of course, has been very, very supportive of the arts, as Mayor Bloomberg has been personally uh, uh, very supportive of the arts. Uh, she was the associate director of the Simon Griffin Center for the Humanities at City College and uh, ha- has worked also at the Brooklyn Academy of Music. Uh, to my right, Susan Quinn. Uh, is the author of uh, a book that I've just been getting done, and it's wonderful, called Furious Improvisation, how the WPA and a cast of thousands made high art out of depression times. Desperate she also, times. Desperate times. Very good. And she is also the, the author of award-winning biographies of Karen Horney and, and Marie Curie. Uh, and uh, she's a staff writer at Boston Magazine. And finally, Leslie Schultz is the executive director of Brick Arts Media in Brooklyn, uh, Brooklyn, as everyone says now, is the new Manhattan. And uh, Brook- I know from uh, my daughter and son-in-law who live there that, uh, that every artist of their generation, every artist, every theater person, every creative person lives within a 20-block radius in Brooklyn. And so Brooklyn is the, where the action is at right now. So we can take it not only to the municipal level, but also to, you might say, to the neighborhood level. And so why don't we uh, continue... So I, 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 we'll start the discussion with, with Rocco Landisman. Anywhere I, it's, uh, anywhere I choose? At any, uh, any well, uh, talk about the current... Um, well, I can ask about, the, about cur- the current state <laughs> of, uh, 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 of funding, maybe at the federal level. What, what's, what's the situation? Well, the... Uh, this, you know the, the 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 big issue right right now at the federal level is the big is, is the deficit and the economic Im- implosion. There is um, you know increasingly a perception that that um, you know the arts are are an extra and and, and add on. I mean it was interesting uh, to draw the um, to draw the comparisons that, that, then and now. Uh, as you mentioned, when the, when the stimulus. When the stimulus program was announced, seven hundred eighty billion dollars, fifty million for the NEA. You know, I turn on the television, I turn on CNBC, and, and there's um, you know Mitt Romney saying this is a frivolous uh, stimulus program. The proof is that there's fifty million dollars for the NEA, and a congressman from Georgia came on and said, "How can you spend fifty million dollars on the National Endowment for the Arts when that money could be spent creating real jobs like road building?" And this was shortly after I was nominated to my position, and I thought, boy, this might not be, may not be an easy job. Um, and it wasn't a real job. Well, it wasn't a real job. I mean, and, you know, and tell someone you know, who's, who's got a talent and a passion for music and works all her life to, be, to, to rise to become the first violinist in a symphony orchestra that she doesn't have a real job. <laughs> I mean, that's, that's something. But this has always been the case. Um, uh, Harry Hopkins, uh, uh, during that time, uh, he, said, he said to Hallie Flanagan, he said, people ride over roads and bridges built by relief workers. Uh, 
but will they, uh, will they ever come to a theater to see shows put on by relief workers? In other words, roads and bridges are real things that people interchange with uh, every day and are real jobs, but art is not. It's, it's, it's an extra, and that, of course, is what we're, we're, we're dealing with now at, uh, at, at the NEA. Um, the president is very... Um, uh, in, you know, uh, engaged by the arts. Uh, he uh, is a writer himself. Uh, he is the first president to have a, um, an arts advisory committee uh, dur during the campaign. So he is very, um, uh, I think, dedicated to, to the arts and to, and to artists. But I think in the, in the reality, at least in terms of my own conversations with him and with others in the, with, in the administration, it's very clear that uh, there's not going to be big new appropriations from Congress for the uh, for the NEA, we will do well to preserve what we have and make maybe incremental progress. Uh, the real money, uh, the real support, uh, if it comes, and, I, and I'm very optimistic, is going to come from the other federal agencies at the points of intersection that the arts have with the. Um, uh, Department of Housing and Urban Development, Department of Education, Department of Transportation, Department of Agriculture, Department of Commerce. Uh, and we have had real initial success um, in terms of my own direct contacts with the cabinet secretaries and, and engagements with their agencies. I'm very encouraged by, by, the, uh, by their buy-in and excitement and interest. And I think you're going to see real, um, real joint uh, NEA and other federal agency programs. One of my proudest moments at the, uh, uh, at the NA during this year and one month at whatever I've been there is when um, we made a joint announcement with HUD. And it was very heartening for me to see just a piece of stationery with our logo at the top of it and the HUD logo at the top of it. And it was a release that said, Chairman of the NEA, Rocco Landisman, and, and Secretary of Housing and Urban Development, Sean Donovan, today announced a, a, a program was $100 million that's going to be uh, jointly administered by, by, by HUD and by the NEA, to which arts organizations can apply. And if we can get that kind of, of uh, momentum through the federal government, then I think you're going to see a new playing field for the arts, uh, at least as far as, as we're concerned. And I you know, can report more on that as we go along. But that's, that's basically the gist of what we're, what we're doing now. One more question. What kind of constraints, and because of the controversies going back 20 years, what kind of constraints is the NEA under in terms of, is it still, for example, not, not able to fund individual artists? Correct. We, we do in some cases. We do in, we do in literature. In, in jazz and opera, but for the most part, we can fund organizations and not individuals, and that's uh, that's not something I'm happy with. You know, we're the National Endowment for the Arts; we should be supporting artists directly. Uh, right now, that's not possible through mandate of Congress. Uh, Is so. the collaboration with other departments new? New. We've never. We've never. The NEA has never been part of uh, domestic policy before, and um, and I think that's something that if this continues. To gather momentum will be um, will be new. Um, I went and I had a meeting. I'll give you an example. I had a meeting with with uh, Tom Vilsack, the Secretary of Agriculture, um, and we talked about what we're trying to do in our programs at the NEA and what we were engaged with. And he, they were very excited about it. And, and uh, Secretary Vilsack said, finally, he said, look, we can go to Congress for a new appropriation. That's a cumbersome process. But we have a community facilities program, and we can dedicate a certain percentage of It's a building program in small towns. We can dedicate a certain percentage of those funds to the arts, design, artist access, artist participation uh, in these buildings. And that, uh, that's new territory for the NEA. Robert Moses was a kind of very controversial figure in this kind of area. But was he, is he kind of a, a model for that type of uh a project. I mean, it may be, it may be casting. It may, it may I probably be. shouldn't touch that one. Yeah. I'll leave that to Kate. <laughs> I mean, some you, of the people who know what they're talking about a little better. But, but um, I'm certainly the built environment. Uh, you know, architecture, um, parks, roadways are a ways are ways that the public in general engage the aesthetic elements in our society, and that and they're, they're very important. I think I want to evaluate whether he. And he also had a grand good, I want to evaluate whether he was good or bad for right, that exactly. Sense. Right. But perhaps an, an earlier model is is uh, what was going on in the 30s in the Roosevelt administration, the idea of improvisation and of you know coming up with new ways to fund artists. Uh, it sounds like you're sort of looking for a new model. And even the Farm Security Administration, which was supposedly documenting poverty, you know, was also doing art. And in that way, perhaps what you were saying about HUD and about 
other agencies being involved is a way to get around some of the resistance in Congress. Give us an example of what a specific yes. collaboration yeah. might be, you know. And, and, and like with HUD, for Yeah, instance. with HUD. Well, let me, let me give you a, uh, a, a very specific example, the Department of Education. Mm -hmm. Uh, they have a program, uh, a Promise Neighborhoods program, that's about the whole, all of the elements that go into successful education, not just teachers, uh, it, you know, it's parents, they're engaging with the kids, the, the whole environment. Well, Promise Neighborhoods is a big funding program, and now the arts have been added as, a, um, as an evaluative metric in that, that if, you, if, you, if, if, a, if a school system has an arts program, that gives them an advantage for these, for these funds. And I said, I said to Arnie Duncan, you know, that's great, but we want to be, we want to be a requirement. We want to be an actual, actual requirement in that structure. And he said, well, this is a great first step because everybody writing to these grants is going to highlight or, or make sure there's an arts program in these, uh, in these schools. That, again, is, is, is new, new territory mm -hmm. for, uh, for the arts and something that's very, very uh, uh, in, encouraging. Okay, uh, on the local it. level, um, I think you're dealing with similar things, aren't you, with the CASA programs and other joint programs that DCAs? Yeah, I mean, it would, we are highly collaborative, and you know, one of the things that we do with the civic version of HUD, the Housing Preservation Development Agency, is uh, use cultural organizations as part of uh, community use programs when there are housing developments. So we are actually building three uh, really nice theater spaces uh, in Hell's Kitchen as part of a project whereby HPD sold a parcel of city-owned land to a private developer. So you have an 80-20 housing project with three theater facilities because it turns out that's what the local community really wanted. So you know, it sort of it depends on how you brand culture, but in fact, in many communities, uh, it is a very robust form of community service. So uh, I mean, I think the the biggest single challenge to me about advocacy in the arts is, I guess, there's sort of two. On the one hand, the constituency itself is so wide ranging. I mean, in New York City, we have the largest zoological society in the world and the smallest startup dance company created last night in someone's bathroom. <laughs> and they don't act together. Um, they don't often recognize that they are similar types of organizations. And the structure of nonprofit business pits organizations against each other. And, you know, mm -hmm. I look for inspiration to the environmental movement, which over the past 20 years has made the polar bear on the dwindling block of ice, everybody's polar bear. It's not mine or yours. Uh, you know, there's a sense of joint appreciation for the issue. I don't know that that's the kind of aspiration the cultural sector is really ready to embrace, but until there's a, a sort of joint willingness and understanding that, in fact, certainly at least in terms of government, a uh, rising tide lifts all boats. The more the sector articulates collectively, the more it will be perceived of as deserving of public benefit. And I was so struck, Nancy, in reading your book by the fact that e even trying to get Hallie Flanagan's Sue. project Sue. Off, the, um, off the ground was, it, it depended on Eleanor Roosevelt. Yes. You, know, you had to have, you had to be taken under someone's wing. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and I, Bill Ivey, former NEA chair, you know, has, has said mm -hmm. culture ends up being an east wing thing, you know, and any wing will do. Mm -hmm. But, but, it, but mm -hmm. it's interesting that, again, you, you don't have an articulated joint identity right. yet in this sector. To be, right. to be blunt, we're reading from Kate Levin's playbook. I mean, the first thing I did when I was nominated was I went to see Kate. What 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 you what she's been doing there with the collaboration of the different city agencies as they intersect with culture is l exactly what we're trying to do now on the uh, on the national level. I mean, Sean Donovan before he was secretary of yeah. HUD was in New York City. He did a lot of stuff in this city, right? And and Fifty Second Street project, Fifty Second Street, which is you know it has to do with our, with the residences and 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 uh, and, a, and a theater. Um, is exactly what we're exactly what we're talking about. That it has a role in economic development. It has a role in supporting the arts, 
And what's been going on for quite a while in New York City and in a couple of other places, Chicago is, is another example, is what we're trying to, uh, trying to engage on a national level. I mean, they're ahead of the curve. We're trying to catch up. But some mm. co- not all collaborations are created equal. And what's interesting to me is that, uh, at least in New York, cultural organizations are beginning to be understood as, again, sources of community <coughs> empowerment. The project that we're working on with Leslie is an economic development. You know, that's, that's sort of the title it comes in. And you know, there continue to be tensions around uh, rate of return issues. You know, where, where is the payback? And, you know, we're investing, I think it's $27 million into uh, renovating a building to house Leslie's organization and another one. And, you know, every step of the way in terms of doing the deal, great with the housing guys, little bit of tension with the mm-hmm. economic development folks because they're, they're looking for a traditional uh, kind of revenue generating uh, exchange. Mm-hmm. So, you know, it's great. Like rev- rev- generating revenue, I think it sounds stupid, but to, to, to what? Economic development is traditionally understood of, you know, making money. And if you don't have a rate of return that is quantifiable, <coughs> you know, it, it's a different kind of but conversation. Who's money? Well, that's, that's, you know, usually the city sells a parcel of property under an economic development project, they get cash. Yeah. And that's, you know, it, it translates directly into something you can quantify in terms of dollars, which is why, you know, I think using economic development as a primary advocacy argument has been necessary, but, you know, we need to go to the next generation of uh, strategy and positioning because if you want jobs, bring in Walmart. Um, You know, what Leslie does is fabulous, but it's never going to be a locus of employment compared to the Atlantic Terminal Mall up the street. Well, in this, uh, one of the other organizations, I think it was Issues Project Room, Mm -hmm. didn't didn't something work there where they they, they got a, there was an enormous tax abatement for the, or some sort of abatement for the developer? It it, it, it was a community benefits. It was, you know, it wasn't so much a tax abatement package. It was in selling, in fact, the old uh, Department of Education headquarters. Um, Part of the deal was that they had to create a community use space. And so that's, uh, you know, Issue Projects Room is the organization that's been designated to go there. There was actually an earlier organization um, that bowed out because they couldn't figure out how to make uh, the dollars work. So, you know, again, it's possible to use uh, zoning and in particular housing development, um, but because of market fluctuations, you're always at the mercy of, uh, you know, where the market is at any given time before you can... Uh, really come to a deal with a developer. And, you know, there are some developers that are much more savvy about the way that a cultural presence will increase real estate value. Mm-hmm. Um, Fort Green. Well, look at, look at Dumbo. I mean, it's sort of fascinating what particularly the Walentises have been able to create as a neighborhood. 20 years ago, you know, it was people associated with On the Waterfront. Um, so, but, but, you know, again, the, the one other thing I will say, and it, it, that's what's so fascinating for me thinking about how short-lived the WPA was, um, <laughs> is that the benefits of culture, and particularly nonprofit culture, and that's a whole other topic, is, you know, how nonprofit culture does and doesn't advocate within the world of for-profit hmm. culture. Right. But um, the benefits of nonprofit culture are really over the long haul. <clears throat> You know, if, mm-hmm. if you Brooklyn is Brooklyn because of the arts community, but it didn't happen overnight. It happened over twenty five right. plus years. Right, right. and, and, and it didn't think, happen from yeah. planning primarily. Well, it happened because did, it happened. did you say it didn't happen from planning? No, I don't think so. It's so interesting because I was thinking a little bit about why is brick at this particular table, and I was you know sort of doing a little surfing last night, and I found this. Um, journal about branding public places and it talked about how the arts in Brooklyn and development of arts in Brooklyn was totally serendipitous and that's actually completely untrue and I think it's a very ahistoric point of view um, you know kind of going way back the band shell where we operate our celebrate Brooklyn performing arts festival which is a great example of how public funding has really made a difference was a WPA project. It was Robert Moses built it in the 1930s. When there was first city public funding for programming in the arts, according to the DCA website, one of the projects that was funded was free programming at Prospect Park in the the band shell. And in the 1970s, when uh, young Howard Golden, youngish Howard Golden came into office, um, you know, 
one of the things that I think he must have done is looked back at Hallie Flanagan and Harry Hopkins and said, how are we going to take this incredibly blighted community and um, try to regenerate it? And Brick's original name was the Fund for the Borough of Brooklyn. It was founded for urban regeneration purposes. That was exactly what it was founded for. Created the Celebrate Brooklyn Festival. It created a space for contemporary artists to exhibit their work. It developed, it had a number, it published book guidebooks, for goodness sakes. I mean, it, it all sounds very familiar. It was seeds. We were supposed to be a catalyst. We were not supposed to be the answer. We were not going to be a federal theater project, but we were going to be a catalyst. And that was very, very deliberately done. And I'm sure there were serendipitous elements as well. The fact, for example, the, when the real estate values in Manhattan went out of sight, then there was a shift. That had to be, that had to be a contribution. But that was interesting, because starting in the 60s, Brooklyn Union Gas and a number of other local industries got together and created something called the Cinderella Project that was devoted to trying to preserve the housing stock in Brooklyn. Mm-hmm. So, you know, wasn't exactly thinking about culture, except to the mm-hmm. extent that historic preservation is very related much to culture. And a part of it. And that's, that, that, that is the sort of foundation on which Brooklyn's regeneration as a residential mm-hmm. borough um, has been built on. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. And, you know, it's interesting. We have a, a board member who's lived her entire life in in Brooklyn. She's a Lynn Nottage, Pulitzer Prize winning playwright and just won the Sternberg Prize. Did I get that right? Steinberg. Steinberg, Steinberg. thank you. Um, And, you know, once in a a casual conversation, I mentioned to Lynn, oh, there were only really artists in Brooklyn until the 80s. And she was, you know, she was a, a, you know, took a little umbrage at that. And sure enough, as I sort of stopped making offhand comments like that, and I looked at there was a phenomenal jazz community in central Brooklyn that, you know. The, Alberta Hunter lived across the street from Bam. Is that, is that right? It, you know, it was just, it was an incredibly thriving artistic community. It wasn't the artistic community that Manhattan was used to, but it was there. And the platform that um, our first program provided at the band shell was to showcase those jazz musicians. It was to showcase the choreographers. And yes, we needed the housing stock, and we absolutely needed the, um, uh, you know, the, the public funding. And we, you know, and we needed some luck. You know, we definitely needed some luck. But it was, you know, the, the seeds were really, really there. Well, to take a very visible example, though, what, why is the Brooklyn Museum struggling, as it, as it seems yeah. to be? Don't believe what you read in the New York Times. No? No. It's, you know, how, how is it struggling any more than any other organization? Well, uh, certainly the impression I got from the Times was oh. that the... the, the Watch the, your sources. The Orient... The Orient... <laughs> Wrong the, source. Orient the, 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 the current sort of popular strategy of orienting itself to the Brooklyn neighborhood has not really been working, at least in terms of bringing in numbers of patrons. Maybe numbers that's of completely... patrons at the Brooklyn Museum cycle up and down depending on mm-hmm. the year. The year before the year that the New York Times chose to cite, they mm-hmm. had over mm-hmm. 150,000 more visitors because it's like any cultural... You know, The Museum of Modern Art has just seen 700,000 visitors to the Picasso show. That is the second highest attendance they've ever had to any show. Mm-hmm. You know, some shows go up. You know, the the incredible show they had of Japanese samurai art, not so much. Mm-hmm. You know, so if you just go on numbers, among other things, I think you are mm-hmm. militating directly against the reason we have nonprofit organizations as a category mm-hmm. separate from for-profit organizations. Mm-hmm. But that the marketplace the, the, is not the only determinant. The Brooklyn Museum is the only fine arts museum. Um, that is a general uh, audience museum that I know of that has a population of visitors that's 45% people of color. That's an enormous contribution to the field. I mean, the Brooklyn Museum grew out of an organization called the Brooklyn Institute for Arts and Sciences, mm-hmm. which, you know, to Leslie's point, give you, gives you some sense of a really visionary stream of planning in the borough of Brooklyn. And I think that was the 1890s that it was created, and the Botanic Garden then spun off of that, and the Brooklyn Academy of Music was affiliated. It was originally built as a, as a private opera house. But, you know, in other words, there's an incredibly strong strand of using arts and culture for uh, inquiry, not just for uh, trying to, you know, bring in the, the, the big bucks. The masterpieces. Yeah. Yeah, well, th- this raises a question that I think was true. It was, it was there on the, in the 30s, and it's been there ever since, the question of how, in funding... How do you balance off the Metropolitan Opera, the Metropolitan Museum, against the small dance company that 
you know, that started yesterday or started three years ago. I mean, as you say, a rising tide lifts all boats, but uh, they're economically and in many other ways, they're in very different position. And I I just wonder how from the funding angle in terms of a a limited set of resources, how you balance off uh, Let me talk support. a little bit about what happened in the 30s, perhaps, with that, because I, th- I was thinking about similarities and differences between then and now and between WPA and arts funding today, and uh, the question of, of quality versus quantity was, of course, a huge question in the, in the 30s, but I think it still is. And as you quantity said... Quantity meaning the numbers of people. Quantity were... meaning the numbers of people who are going to be served versus quality of the product, of the art. And, you know, where do you... How do you find that balance? <laughs> And as you mentioned, um, to be a WPA employee, you had to be on relief. However, most artists could easily, if they weren't on relief, they could easily get on relief because they were so impoverished. And I think that's still true, yeah. actually. That's right. uh, I do, you know, uh, for many, many artists. So that, there's not so much difference there. But then the, the, the question that Hallie Flanagan faced and all of the arts directors faced in Federal One, which was, by the way, there were four, there were four WP arts projects. There was a writer's project, a music project, a theater project, and a visual art project project. Um, and all of them faced the same thing because they were they wanted to get as many people in the program as possible. This was a relief program, as you said. So then Hallie Flanagan in particular, I think, is an interesting example of somebody who improvised brilliantly. Um, one of her problems that she faced was that she um, many of the people on relief were vaudevillians, old vaudevillians who'd been displaced even before the Depression by the talkies. So she had all these thousands of vaudevillians to employ, but she didn't want to do vaudeville. She didn't she want, want to, to do... Vaudeville. She absolutely did not want to. I mean, there was still some around, but she, did, she wanted to do new um, uh, cutting-edge work, you know, and she, she was passionate about that. I think Houseman called her a wild little woman, <laughs> and, and she truly was. Uh, so she came up with this idea, um, uh, along with um, uh, Elma Rice, of um, putting on uh, these living newspapers. And again, she went to documentation. It's like the Farm Security Administration. This was about dealing with current issues. There was one called Power, about electric power and public versus private ownership of power. There's one about uh, about uh, uh, the AAA and the farm crisis. There was one called One Third of a Nation, which was about housing. And all of these living newspapers used a ton of vaudeville techniques to tell a complex story of a current issue. They also used a ton of people. And they, most of them employed over 100 actors. So, you know, it was an ex- example of, of something you could do with the, this federal program that you could never, ever do with theater now. Um, and, and in fact, the, the challenge is the opposite. It was an employment program. It was an employment program. Right. Now the challenge is to write a play with, you know, as few characters as possible so it's economically feasible to put it on. So, um, but that same question about quality versus quantity has to be a question you are dealing with all the time. Um, also, the whole issue of state versus federal control, which I'm sure you're dealing with too, which was a huge issue for all of the Federal One programs, uh, because the road building programs and bridge building programs were very much joint state and federal programs. Um, but the things that worked for building roads didn't work for art, because as soon as you get to the state level with these programs, often you're dealing with politicians who, have, who know very little about art, um, just like the congressmen don't also. <laughs> I think Brooks Atkinson said about, about the theater that for congressmen, um, theater was essentially a leg show. <laughs> you know, and that was the level at which they understood the arts uh, generally. And then when you went to the state level, even more so, and then there were all kinds of... Uh, of uh, local political uh, issues, people wanting to employ their relatives, et cetera, all that kind of thing. So that the the WPA arts programs, Federal One, all of those uh, leaders fought viciously to keep them the programs controlled at the federal level. And this was something that you said, Eleanor Roosevelt, and she was really important, but Hopkins really took the ball and ran with it. And he's, he, he was passionate about this. He, he said at one point that... Um, that uh, art adds to the wealth of the nation, 
I love that idea. And he wasn't just talking about payback in terms of funds. He was talking about a, a deeper sense of the wealth of the nation, but which you, those you deal with, too. required collaboration at the local level. Certainly for the Treasury Department murals, they had to be approved, always, always approved. Oh, yes. The plans had to yeah. be approved at the local level. Right. So they, apart from the question of control, there was a collaboration was absolutely necessary. There was collaboration, but then there was always pressure to mm. hire certain people and so on, and the congressmen always wanted to get their you know, fingers into the pot. And ultimately, of course, what happened to the WPA programs was that they were the federal theater program and then the others, but especially federal theater and the federal writers program were attacked by HUAC under Morris Dyes, and they were made, uh, they were targeted as red communist programs. But what I, I try to develop in my book, I think successfully, is the fact that communism was actually um, an excuse and that what they, the congressmen really hated most was the whole progressive nature of the federal theater and federal writers program, and particularly the, 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 their, their attitudes toward race. And the fact that they were integrated. The book makes that case so strong, and the race was infused with everything that was. Everything that, that came up. The, 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 the federal theater, especially, had integrated casts, insisted on integrated audiences, and had um, these Negro units, as they were called, who were doing this really amazing work. The most famous, which many of you probably know of, was Orson Welles' Voodoo Macbeth, which was produced in Harlem with an all black right. cast. First. Uh, pretty much the first uh, Shakespeare production with an all-black cast, and it was a re reset from moved from Scotland to Haiti, and uh, it became a, a very famous, important, emblematic um, piece of theater. And the Federal Theater actually integrated backstage work for the first time, and, and that that was one of the lasting. We talk about lasting things. That was one of the one of the lasting things there was, was the, really, the integration. Really interesting. Um, question asked earlier about whether the NEA can pay artist fees. And of course, mm -hmm. what was happening was the federal government was producing theater. It was actually producing Directly. these works. And yeah. in the 80s, I guess the NEA was actually funding, funding particular Directly. works. As I understand it, in Chicago, the Department of Cultural Affairs actually presents a lot of work. And um, in New York, you it's much more indirect subsidy. And I was wondering if you have a thought about the pros and cons of each model. I mean, it, certainly in Western Europe, in Asia, in pretty much every other continent where there is federal funding for the arts, the premise is that the government owns the buildings and the employees are employees of the government. Um, and you know, and that is the case in other parts of the country. In New York, because of the sort of weird history of, you know, sort of inadvertently enlightened, I would say, history of how cultural funding has developed, we own 33 cultural institutions, but they are run by private nonprofits. And then at this point, we fund another 880 organizations. And for us, it works that there is a separation, as it were, of church and state. And this mayor certainly happens to be very keen on keeping that separation and keeping you know, the creativity and the vision in the hands of the private sector. Um, because otherwise, you know, I think the history of the WPA makes it clear it is so easy to uh, offend, to become a pawn in a larger kind of political machination. So I think in general it actually has worked to the benefit and the vitality mm -hmm. of the cultural scene. But it's interesting because it, the the larger political discourse in in New York City, the you know cultural funding has certainly been cut from time to time, but nowhere near the precipitous drop in state funding or you know in the dark days of the 90s federal funding, and that's partly because actually there is a very strong consensus on the part of local elected officials about the value of culture in their neighborhoods and their communities. And it does often set up a really difficult tension between the ways in which electeds will want their programs or you know, want to advance their agenda. But I think we make a mistake to simply assume that that's a bad thing. Because again, if you're talking about government funding as opposed to private funding, you really do need stakeholder buy-in. It needs to feel urgent for local electeds as a service in the same way senior centers and libraries and other real nodes of social preservation and energy are 
vital. So, you know, I think it, it, it's, it's important to think about that. And you've, you've been traveling all the United States. I'd well, love to know what you're Well, just to pick up on that, I think, I think that separation you're talking about can, can be very, very uh, important. Uh, I mean, taking take from your book, uh, Dye's called the whole works progress, uh, the whole federal theater and works progress effort, uh, to quote, a link in the, in the vast, unparalleled New, New Deal propaganda machine. <laughs> now, he went from there to say it was basically an arm of the Communist Party, and those are the hearings. But the first part of that sentence is not entirely yeah, wrong. That's absolutely true. <laughs> that, and as I read, read, read your book and others, you realize that, first of all, the, the, the Roosevelt, and with, the, with the whole New Deal propaganda machine, they put out these photographers and, and, and artists and, and playwrights uh, to, in, in a sense, show the American people all the good things that they were doing we and how great the administration New was. Deal programs, and to support the, right, and to support the New Deal programs. So there was a vast propaganda machine. And if you look at a lot of the art itself, a lot of the stuff of the federal theater, the living newspapers, sure. uh, you know, the, even famously Brooks Atkinson started to uh, object to it. A lot of it was uh, propaganda. It right. was not very interesting uh, as art, and uh, when Hallie Flanagan was asked about it, she said, "Well, I don't believe in propaganda, but I do believe in propaganda for you know health care and for social justice, right. and for you know so on and so forth." So, so this this kind of one remove that that, that Kate is talking about uh, is healthy and does promote, I think, a diversity of of, uh -huh. of, of opinion and, and expression that you don't have with you know massive federal uh, ownership as you as, as you have in in, in Europe. Yeah, Rocco, with your with your with your collaborative type notion, isn't there some danger like where, 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 the, where the, the NEA is looked at as a kind of a stepchild, and, 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 and so you're, you're going you're going with your you know your your you're going um, with your, your hand in your mouth to, to the to the HUD or to any of the other agencies and saying will you co will you collaborate with us? Is there a oh, danger of someone losing? I'm hand in hand every day. I mean, I don't care, I don't care about planting the NEA flag on different mountaintops. I care about getting support out to to, to artists and the artistic community wherever it comes from. I don't but, care. But what, I don't they, care whether what, the I don't care whether the NEA is labeled. On it. What, 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 on it means nothing. No, no, I don't mean that. But I mean, what, what happens if they say to you, "Oh, yes, we're we're really interested in that, but we don't want to have Karen Finley's Chocolate Woman," you know, or we don't want to have, you know, in other words, we they, they say it's great, but they, it's a more leveling effect. We 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 have a much broader constituency than the NEA, and we're willing to you know carry carry you on our coattails, but. We are going to say to you, X, Y, and Z can't be part of the program because we can't have that in the in infrastructure type programs. Well, public art does tend to be more bland. That's yeah, I think I think what's, that, that you're going to do, they'll do X, Y, and Z, which I think will benefit arts and artistic organizations, uh, and, they'll, and the, the, the trick is to find, find support for the others yeah, and patronage for it. You know, we, we're, we're a good example. We were just chatting around the office the other day. Have we run into a situation in our 32 years of something which was too controversial to put out there? And the answer actually was no, we really haven't had to deal with the sensation. We haven't, should I keep talking? Yeah, you, you, you can talk, you can talk. Um, we really haven't had to deal with a sensation type exhibit, you know, at the, at the Brooklyn Museum. Um, but what we, doesn't mean that it's bland, I, I don't think. I mean, I think that it may be that it's, you know, more personal. It may be that it is looking at society as opposed to particularly having a message, you know, being, being message art. But I think what's, what, what is also really key to what we're doing as a, you know, as a publicly funded institution is we're incubating artists. We're giving the, them the opportunity to take their art in a lot of different directions. And I think that... Um, you know, it, it's not that it's dumbed down. It's that that's the part that isn't actually being presented by us. In terms, yeah. of, uh, in terms of what you were saying about government versus nonprofit, if I understood correctly, how much, uh, and, and, the, and the pluses and minuses, how available, how much the large New York cultural institutions open themselves and offer themselves to schools and students. In other words, the students, for example, go uh, for free to the Met. Huge numbers, 100,000 yeah, plus. Big, it's a big thing. Annually. I mean, it, it's interesting because the city of New York caused both the Museum of Natural History and the Metropolitan Museum to be created back when it was 18... 69, the other was 1871, and written into the original charters of both organizations was that school teachers would be admitted free because, again, they were looked on as educational 
institutions. And, you know, so, you know, this sort of creates, articulates the baseline that cultural organizations are educational institutions. The and Metropolitan Opera also? The Metropolitan Opera has the Metropolitan Opera Guild, which has one of the most exciting arts education programs in the country, I would say. But there are huge numbers of organizations that exist solely to provide arts education, and then all of our major and not-so-major, in terms of size organizations, um, provide some kind of educational piece, whether it's an outright curriculum, you know, because we've also collaborated very closely with the Department of Education in creating an uh, arts curriculum, K-12, through in the four state-mandated disciplines. But it, it's one of the... It, the whole issue of education is interesting because it's one of the ways in which culture doesn't stay in its lane, and that's part of why the hat-in-hand mode, I happen to think, is the right way to go, because culture... You know, 40% of the organizations we fund provide really meaningful social services, aside from arts education, in things like services to seniors, to the disabled community, to incarcerated families. Um, you know, they're, they're varied to immigrant English language learners. Uh, culture happens to create a pedagogy and an environment in which certain kinds of things can take place very successfully that, you know, adhere to the benefit of society. Our, our Brooklyn Borough President is most excited about culture because in a city where 40% of New Yorkers were born outside the United States, it's the one tried and true means by which people who come to this city and country can retain you know, the best of their cultural and heritage yeah. and yet integrate right. themselves and be accepted and you know it becomes a positive way it, it becomes a positive thing that they have to offer but again if you you know just think about the arts funding it it too easily transmutes to an issue of taste you know what's good mm-hmm. what's not good mm-hmm. and you know then then you get bound up in all kinds of issues of access in big and small I mean, you know, the folks at the Rockefeller Foundation have done some really interesting research that shows that the form of cultural participation that is most extensive in this country is choral singing. Mm -hmm. So, you know, when you really start thinking about what cultural engagement's Mm -hmm. like, it's not primarily necessarily bound up in institutions. And so if you're just thinking through that filter, Mm -hmm. you know, I think that's part of the reason why cultural funding gets tripped up so often in a government context is because you're creating hierarchies of taste that people find very offensive and they're not wrong. You know, so unless you Mm -hmm. can figure out a a better level to have that discourse where lots of different kinds of things, you know, can be valued, doesn't mean everything's good and it doesn't mean everything should benefit from taxpayer funding. But... Again, the, I think a large reason why culture tends to get marginalized is it's not understood for the sort of multiplicity of kinds of services that it provides, and it too easily gets caught up in, I like it, I don't like it, I like you, I don't like you, and then you're screwed. And the culture, there's, there's, culture is dispensed by these marble temples that are high on a hill that, yeah. aren't, that are pretty for, you know, forbidding and, and not too accessible for most people. And one of, one of the jobs is to get even some of these institutions out and around a bit, sure. or the kind of art that's, that, you know, that, that that's engaged there out and around a bit. And uh, you know, that's a healthy development. But, there, but there, are there inalienable rights? I mean, like the famous thing that happened to Giuliani administration, I think he, he was opposed to Andre Serrano, wasn't it? The, the, the guy who had urinated on the cross. Yes, Christ. Yeah, yeah. 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 Sensationalist. Yeah, he, yeah he, and, 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 he, and he basically said, you know, we, we, we can't, the city can't support this kind. Chris O'Feely. Elephant okay, Chris O'Feely. Chris O'Feely with the... Uh, Elephant Dung on, the Ma- right. on Madonna. Right. Uh-huh. Yeah, right. So that, that type of thing, where you have kind of a bill of rights, of you know, the sense in which there are uh, expression has has its own value and should not be kind of a kind of a kind of a, a question of numbers or a question of you know a majority of taste in one way or another. I mean that there that 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 artistic expression per se is is and what I'm what I'm concerned about is on the one hand it's 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 wonderful to think about this kind of millenarian view of art and and government. On the other hand, I'm concerned about the loss of individual individual expression. When you have taxpayer dollars, there's there's going to be uh, a perfectly legitimate uh, voice from those taxpayers saying, "Well, you know, it's a free country; you can do anything anywhere. But if it's going to be with my money, I want you know some some things may um, may offend me." And I and I think that that's a good reason why you don't have the government actually producing the art right now. But what does government funding do for the different arts institutions? I mean, putting aside the 33 that are owned 
by the city or 35 mm-hmm. that are owned by the city. You know, what, what happens at, at BRIC with the city money we get, the state money, and the federal <coughs> money is it's leveraged tremendously. You know, it mm-hmm. turns into dollars from corporations, dollars from foundations, right. um, dollars from individuals. I mean, we're so, you know, the individual funding that um, we have really managed to generate since we stopped being so subsidized by government in the early part of this decade, or the last decade, is fantastic. And that allows the institutions to maybe do some things that are separate from the projects that you guys specifically, the NEA specifically gives us money for, or that you know NISCA, New York State Council of the Arts, gives us money for. And you know it's always a balance. There's this tension is not going to go mix. away. Yeah. It right. is not going to go away, and mm-hmm. it's a and it's quest- a productive tension. Right. You know mm-hmm. Shakespeare wrote his plays during a period where they were censored. There was an official mm-hmm. censor that had to sign off on every mm-hmm. single one. You know it's not necessarily a terrible right. thing to be tracking a larger sort of public set mm-hmm. of imperatives. There's a multiplicity of art and also of its funding. I mean, yeah, that's great. One, one I, mean, I, I, would, I would love my, my dream little soapbox moment. I would love for all curators to have to take a course called Curating Controversy because I do think a lot of times mm-hmm. the impulse for doing controversial art, you know, comes from a th- third finger salute to the bourgeois, for, to whoever. And it's, about, it's, it's very much about provocation and it's not There's necessarily responsible to the fact that, you know, you have an audience. If you want to hit someone over the head, you know, go do that. But, but, but the key, There's a the selfish narcissistic the key element, element I agree. Of, of, of the government of our mm-hmm. country, which, mm-hmm. it, which you have, in, I was just to bring this up again, mm-hmm. inalienable rights, mm-hmm. and they're not predicated on the will of the majority. Mm-hmm. Shouldn't there be an inalienable rights for artistic expression in the same way? Because, like you just there pointed is, out, but there, there would be no... There would be no... Right. Right. There would be no... Right. Right. There is an inalienable right for the government to fund it. Yeah, they have a right to say what they want, but they don't have a right to be funded. If you had a situation where there was only government funding, you would have an interesting argument, but there's such a multiplicity of funding like now, I don't, I don't think it's terribly relevant anymore. I, think, I, I like uh, Leslie's word incubating also because um, I, it, it, thinking about the WPA, for instance, a lot of the artists who worked on the WPA, and there were people like Richard Wright and Saul Bellow and Stuart <laughs> Davis and uh, Ben Sean, they they would probably agree with you about some of the some of the uh, art that was produced and about the New Deal propaganda part of it. But at the same time, and I must say about Brooks Atkinson, uh, he also said that the Federal Theater was the best friend the theater ever had in the United States, and, and, and I and think that's right. true. But at the same time, but there was his propaganda element, and a lot of things weren't very good. But they incubated artists who went on to do phenomenal. The original phenomenal work, <clears throat> maybe very outspoken, cutting-edge critical work like Richard Wright or... Um, um, Hubert Selby, uh, Les Takes at the Book, uh, never been, uh, Jackson never been funded Pollock. by an arts bar- right, Jackson, Jackson Pollock, Pollock was funded by WPA. James Baldwin was funded by WPA, not to do his own very own work. You know, and he probably, and all of these artists, this is one of the problems with artists, is they were probably putting down WPA Later every on, single they, day they were collecting they their paycheck. For what they did. Utter contempt. Yeah. But it, it, it was a job, and art. they developed, you know, as artists mm-hmm. as a result of this, you know, and so. Um, I think there's a, there's a role definitely for government support, and it's not going to necessarily do kind of controversial stuff. One area where things have moved backwards, actually, that, 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 you know, that also involve in a way funding for the arts. A lot of schools, because it is a soft option, a lot of schools in New York certainly have eliminated their arts professionals because that was an easy place for them to cut. Yeah. I know this because my daughter worked for the Lincoln Center Institute and then for the Film Society at Lincoln Center, which got to send a lot of artists add into schools on a day-by-day basis simply because those schools had gotten rid of their resident artists, their teachers who were (laughs) teaching the arts. And so if you don't have uh, any arts education in the schools, you're not building an audience for the arts when you know they grow up later on. So there you have a a problem, you might say, at the front end. Major major issue. Yeah. And and that's you know what what happens is that um, that art education role starts falling or has started to fall in New York to the cultural institutions who mm-hmm. actually hire teaching artists to go right. into the schools. It is mm-hmm. a you know form of yes. employment, and it is also that's you a, know it, that's exactly it, what my daughter did. Yes, and it you know it, it it's got its you know it's got its place. It's it's been. 
very interesting. Um, you know, I think what you have is sort of, it's, there's an analogy to the charter schools when you've got lots yeah. of culturals going in and sort of bringing their particular approach to arts education to the to the schools. I don't know how you deal with sort of quality control and how the you know the dollars are being spent, but it's not like it's created a vacuum. It's actually the the instinct to provide arts education has just gone elsewhere. Well, I think. the New York City Department of Education has now developed a quality rubric because that's you know again part of the the glory and the frustration of arts in a government context is people don't want to put a stake in the ground about value. Um, so if you have school leadership that wants to do the right thing, doesn't necessarily know how, how are they supposed to know that a program's good or not? And you know, there's huge resistance in the cultural community when we started this a couple of years ago, because you know, I know good when I see it. Well, my good night might not be your good. And if we can't you know, agree on certain kinds of precepts, and it, you know, it was a very interesting process developing um, this thing called the quality reflection tool, which is a name that drives me a little crazy. But, but the fact is, it exists, and it's been piloted in schools, and school leadership seems to be able to use it productively. So that's good. But again, getting things what out is of the... I'm not, I'm not yeah, what is it? Yeah. it? It's basically, it, it's a document that says, here's how you can tell and evaluate the um, uh, benefit and impact of your arts ed programs. And, you know, some of it's pretty basic. It's like, you know, if the teacher's doing all the talking and the kids are just sitting there, probably it's not a very good program. Um, but it's also, you know, what are, what are the kinds of things you can expect children at different levels of their maturity to be able to do? What are the, what are the ways in which each lesson should engage a child? Um, and, you know, it's tied to this uh, curriculum that's been developed and uh, redeployed in the school system. But again, Sometimes engagement with the arts just keeps them in school in the first place. Yeah. Well, that, that yes. is very true. You know, when we go into a school, we have a very strong and, and highly regarded NEA-funded um, arts ed, visual arts education program Happy in the school. Happy to be of help. Sorry? Happy to be of help. <laughs> Thank you. Sorry. Keep it coming. Um, and, and, you know, one of the things that we do with our schools in Brooklyn, we're in very, very underserved areas. Is, is we go in and say, well, what, what problem do you want to solve? What are you trying to accomplish with this? And, you know, one of my favorite schools was a high school, I think it was in Fort Greene, where they said, well, we really want the kids to come to school. Could you help us get the kids to come to school? And that's easy to track. You know, they're, they, you yeah. know they know that they are actually... Um, they're coming or not. That, that, <laughs> that they're coming. But, you know, it's a very key thing. I, there's one school that we were in for a long, long time. This is IS-49. It was in, you know, I, I guess it's now, you know, it was Bushwick. And now it's Williamsburg, or maybe it's the other way around. Um, it's... it's um, but it was a school, a middle school, filled with gangs. I mean, it was just amazing. Shootings happened there, et cetera. Stuff that, you know, we'd never expect our kids to be exposed to. Um, many of the kids there couldn't speak English. They were, you know, it was the second language, and they were not articulate. But the kids who were involved in the program we had there, we had a gallery in the school. I'd see their names on the honor roll list outside of the principal's office. I would see those kids looking towards art high schools when they're applying from the, you know, middle schools on. It's made, you know, it makes a really, you know, really huge difference. And again, that's anecdotal assessment, but I think it's important valid yeah, evidence. You have to have the art, arts in the schools. There's a, uh, the President's Committee on the Arts and Humanities, which works with, with the NEA, uh, is... Uh, Planning to 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 launch an um, an artist core uh, in in schools uh, across the country, with of course, you know, uh, echoes of, of of what went on in the uh, in the 30s, uh, which I think could have a transformative effect. I mean, Harry Hopkins put 6,000 musicians in the in the schools, in the school systems, and you know, his reasoning was. Let's have them do something they are really good at and know how to do, rather than just out building, you know, digging ditches and build, build, building roads. And uh, it obviously was tr tremendously important for those musicians, and you can't help but believe that it had a profound influence on the kids that, that were exposed to it who wouldn't have had access to that otherwise. I think this is something we have to start looking at again. Very systematically. Look, older people in this room, myself included, will remember going to concerts at Lewiston Stadium, which was, after all, City College and a public institution. I'm not that old. <laughs> 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 uh, and, you know, in terms of the model, you know, of course, the, the European model of, the, of government ownership of, of the arts will never really work here, but it did work in small ways at various times. Uh, I think the, uh, you know, thinking about why that is, you know, 
when you brought that up, I thought, well, why, why has that never worked here? And, and it's partly, I think, that in Europe, certainly when I was living in France, I realized that their sense of culture as their patrimony, the sense that, that the greatest national pride, part of the great national pride resides in their cultural heritage. Uh, and... Uh, and, of course, that often leads to a very conservative uh, support for the arts, for very venerable arts institutions. On the other hand, it doesn't always, for example. The city of Berlin uh, has, yeah. does great support for the arts, including very cutting-edge arts, very provocative arts, very, you know, that, that uh, encouraging theatrical and operatic productions that are, that are very striking and, and provocative. And I think so, Great Britain does a pretty good yeah, job, too, yeah. in terms of allowing so, a, a, quite a range. Uh, on the other hand, I, I think... You know, in terms of the whole, uh, I, I'm, I'm a little troubled by the whole idea of the hierarchy of taste because, of course, although it's true, some people like this and some people like that, I think we all would agree that there is good art and there's, not, there's art that's not so good, even though it may have a very good communal function in terms of involving lots of people and so on and so forth, but that we wouldn't make a case for it as we would not make a case for most of the WPA work as art. Uh, we'd make a case for it perhaps as valuable artistic activity. Uh, and the the uh, I think that that that, that a cult- the notion of cultural hierarchy is much more established in Europe, and it very was very difficult, perhaps for good reasons, not to establish here because of America's democratic traditions. There was a high degree of suspicion of any form of cultural hierarchy, uh, and uh, a much greater affinity for for popular arts, for folk arts, for local arts, and so on and so forth. Uh, And even, for example, the great vogue of Shakespeare production in America in the 19th century was essentially a very popular, you know, it was a very very popular tradition, Shakespeare as a popular artist, the way he had been to some degree during the Elizabethan period. So uh, I think there are structural and, and historical elements in American culture that will always act as a certain break upon uh, uh, very, uh, ways of supporting the arts and will make this kind of dual model or these in, indirect mm-hmm. forms of funding or not putting the government's name directly on something always much more appealing uh, uh, in the United States as it would not be in Europe. Uh, uh, and, and, and uh, uh, you know, a great deal of what we've been talking about really follows from that. This might be a good place to, uh, if people want yeah. to... Um, want, uh, you want to... I, have one, I want to raise one more topic. Go ahead. Do we have sure. time? Yeah. Um, I, uh, I remember a conversation I had with a, uh, a friend of mine, a, a country music singer, about her family going back generations after generation. And she said, well, I would sum up my family history by saying there was the Depression and there was the Depression. <laughs> and, uh, you know, you, you, you quote Alfred, Alfred Kazin in your book that, that no one who lived through the Depression ever recovered from it. And you take up, I think, very... Uh, eloquently in, in, in your book, this whole issue of, of what the uh, what the depression meant uh, psychologically, that uh, that the the economic problems were, were were complicated by emotional problems. You know, people's sense of confidence, their self worth, their sense of reality, as uh, as, as you put it. That. Uh, the, the, this, what happened, a state of mind was created with a, with a lowering of the economic horizons. And that the purpose of a lot of this art was to engage and, and, and uh, address that. That there was a, a um, uh, possibly an antidote to that kind of profound um, uh, psychological dislocation and, and depression, and and you know we know, we know that this the word depression was something that Hoover uh, happened upon as as by way of saying well as opposed to it would normally be called a panic, but a depression would be something you know temporary but, milder milder. <laughs> but he ended up inadvertently labeling it, labeling it, labeling it as exactly what it was in all of its different manifestations, mm. and I wonder if art isn't something you turn to because being happy. Being <clears throat> fulfilled, uh, being ex- expressive, isn't something that is fundamental to our humanity. And 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 uh, you know, you go back during the Depression, people were, people were citing uh, not so much the Constitution, but the Declaration of Independence, with a right to the pursuit of pursuit of happiness. Uh, I find it you know I find it amazing when when I when I uh, found that Ronald Reagan, when he was defending support for the arts. Of all people, he quoted George Washington. He said, George Washington declared in 1781 that both arts and sciences are essential to the prosperity of the state 
and to the ornament and happiness of human life. They're essential to the happiness of human life. And I think that notion that they're essential to our happiness uh, and our, our, our expression as human beings, that, that notion started then. And I wonder to what extent it is relevant now and can continue in this kind of very sour time that we're, uh, that we're living in at this point. That's well, a long way of stating the topic, but I think, I think it's an interesting one. I mean, I've been going around the country arguing that during the 1930s, besides the New Deal, the arts were the other great stimulus program of the, of the, of the 1930s, that the New Deal provided economic stimulus, but also Roosevelt personally in his fireside chats and speeches provided this kind of psychological stimulus that also came from the arts, that the arts uh, provided, you know, created a kind of energy and excitement and happiness or a kind of dream right. of happiness that, in fact, was crucial to the psychology of the Depression. So the question arises, well, always, well, well, what about today? Well, you know, things are pretty grim, and they look like right. they're going to be grim for a long time. Uh, you know, well, we'll see. It's a, you know, maybe they're not quite grim enough to stimulate the arts as, 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 as dramatically as they did in the 1930s. But yeah. there's great solace when you, you know, when, when, when uh, I'm, I, I don't particularly, I'm not, I don't worship it in any, in, in any form of organized religion. But when someone dies, there's great solace in coming together afterwards and being with those, those people who survived. And similarly, like artistic organizations can function to some extent, like churches. That is to say, you they're go to communal. difficult times. Yes. They're communal, and they are like people come to. Build Hades, because it's a place to go. That is one in, in, in our neighborhood, you know. And they and and they see each other, and we, we watch movies, and we have discussions like this one. And even in these very difficult times, it is a way of kind of it provides a kind of catharsis for the difficult. After, after 9/11, the first thing the mayor said, Mayor, mayor Giuliani, he, he called each of us, each of the theater owners, and he said, "Get the theaters open as fast as you can." Mm. It wasn't get the stores open. Mm. It was get exactly. the theaters open. That's it. And we opened them the next night. We missed we missed one night. And I remember giving a curtain speech at the, at, at the producers and saying, we're coming in here as a social expression. We come in here as a group. You usually come with people, and then you sit with people, and you share an exchange with other people. And in that particular case, you're coming to laugh and to have fun. Exactly. And you're entitled to do that, even in this you know, darkest possible time. And the arts have always... Always had that uh, had that fun. There's a wonderful scene in, in Sullivan's Travels, excuse me, that, that, that just epitomizes this. There, as you may remember, the movie, the Preston Sturgis movie. There are all these convicts, and and, and, and Sullivan, who's this, this Hollywood director, he's been exiled. To this, he's been mistaken as a criminal, and he's in this place, and the, and they and they show these Mickey Mouse cartoons, you know, and 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 they all these guys are all chained to the chairs, and they all start to laugh, and they just have this. In the, Sturgis captures it. Their eyes just light up. They're just totally taken away for a moment by this, but. We're essentially Disney cartoons. But I think the thing that you have to add to that is that in the last couple of decades, of course, things have been moving in the opposite direction. In other words, everyone with their iPod and their VCR and their this and that, that a lot of the arts that used to be communal, let's say in a movie theater and so on, have become personalized and individualized Hmm. in a way that has kind of decommunalized them. Good point. Uh, And and at the same time, there's really... There's a lot of art going on using this modern technology. I mean, YouTube is nothing but all That's sorts yeah. of art all the time. I mean, we've given everybody in, individual control about when they're going to watch and listen to anything at any time, any time they want, and so on. But that, I mean, the, the idea, for example, that Roosevelt could go on the radio or uh, a movie could open and everybody in the country would be listening to that speech or, or going to that movie at exactly the same time or, listen, or seeing that, that, that newsreel or something like that, that yeah, that's true. It was true certainly even in the early years of television. But, it, but isn't, that, isn't, that, isn't that happening again? I mean, Walter Benjamin wrote Art in the uh, in the Age of Mechanical Rep- Reproduction, 1936, because you know you suddenly had newsreels, the proliferation right. proliferation, right. proliferation of radio, right. uh, all of these things, uh, and the and the idea was now art is going to be accessed by vastly right. more right. Amount, <laughs> more amounts of people. Well, the same thing's happening now within the last couple of years They're with, with the digital but revolution. I, that I don't think it's quite as dire that people are putting themselves in their own little bubble and in their in their own iPod. I mean, I think that there are many different types of... You see this on the subway. There, Everybody's in no, the subway. No, I know you see it on the subway, but access. people weren't listening to music before on the subway. But, you know, but what you have That's is... <laughs> you know, if, if art... If, the, if the, the reason for our putting aside the economic development piece of it, but if it is spiritual and uplifting and, and because it puts you in a very different place, there's... There's an analogy there to parks 
there's an analogy there to public libraries. I mean, I think those sort of, you know, those things always come together in, in my mind. You know, we are, there is a, an, an explosion, I think you'd agree, Kate, of free performing arts programming all over New York City. And people come. People come to our Summer Performing Arts Festival, you know, 8,000, 10,000 people, and they are having a communal experience. Mm -hmm. They really are. You see them walking down Prospect Park West afterwards, really engaged in talking totally. to each other. And, and, it, and the so Bryant Park ones, too, are huge. Yeah. Yeah. And, it's, and that's something I that... Think there's a well, I think there's a tremendous hunger for this kind of community. I, I think yeah. there really is. And I think that yeah. while it's vitally important to fund the Metropolitan Opera, and it is vitally important to fund what you know you would consider the more elite institutions. You know, I'm thrilled that there is a commitment on the city's part, on NEA's part, to actually say, are we providing opportunities for people to come together with virtually no barriers to em entry? And that where we are serving both the traditional arts audiences, because the quality is up here, um, as well as the untraditionally served audiences. Where the quality can also be up here. I mean, the same programming. We fund have operating budgets of $250,000 or less. You don't have to be big to be good. S same same programming, actually. I mean, that's sort of yeah. the ideal situation where you're presenting Just works different. from West Africa, you're pre presenting works from, from Israel, from Eastern Europe, from Mexico, from East L.A., from Brooklyn, from Brooklyn, from Brooklyn. And the quality is, you know, is really there. And it is evolving, too. And this is... a, a what WPA did that was brilliant in, in a very depressed time was to make art accessible to many, many people for for no money, mm -hmm. you know. And uh, people, who, many people who had never seen live theater saw theater for the first yes. time during the uh, during the Federal Theater Project. Uh, so this is carrying on that that tradition. We should open up. Uh, the, I think yeah. we should open up uh, anyone who would like to have a come, come to the mic to the mic and pose your question because uh, we record you. My name is Joe Lempel. I'm with the Maisels Institute Center for Documentary Films, and I would like to say thank you so much. I mean, it's a really enlightening, very interesting conversation, and it's helped me a lot. But I would like to ask a question to uh, Rocco Lanzman and uh, Kate Levin about, um, you know, grants from, um, from government organizations. And quite aside from the fact that there are limited monetary funds, and that there may have to be compromises made by not-for-profit organization. I'm just wondering if one were to be given a grant from a government organization, doesn't that give the organization, the not-for-profit organization that receives the grant, a kind of prestige and a kind of a legitimacy that they can use to segue into yeah. getting monies this from other right. organizations? Yep. Yeah. Yeah, it's an imprimatur. I'm just jumping in. But I've always, Thank you. It, it, it's always been fascinating to me. People want our money and don't want to give us credit for having given the money because there's so much suspicion about the role of government in the arts. Really? I mean, again, I don't, I don't take it personal, but it's, you know, you, there are so many organizations mm -hmm. that will not acknowledge or seek to publicize the degree of government funding they receive because they're afraid it will discourage private sector donors or they're afraid that somehow it will compromise their reputation for independent programming. So there's absolutely the leverage function and you know that's part of the, the main argument we make for continuing government funding but there is also this very uh, different uh, sense in the field that militates against acknowledging government funding. I don't think the NEA suffers from that quite well, as much. we give away so little. I mean, you give, you give away. <laughs> All we're giving away is the validation power. You know, the, the, the stickers. That's key. That, you know. That's key, though. Right. I mean, that's it's one of the main things we have to give, alas. <laughs> we have another question? Uh, so my name is Francesca Tertriano. Do I need to say something about myself? Well, it, I'm, okay. I'm, I'm, I'm I, 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 um, I, um, support artists in a small local community, having left Manhattan after 40 years here, uh, and have just uh, led uh, a large-scale effort for, toward economic development in this small community called Norfolk Arts Wave. And much to my surprise, it was such a smash hit that the Huffington Post picked it up, and something called Black Tie International. And uh, it, it's, a, it's, a, it's a good way for this town to go. Uh, but my question is, is uh, arises from an experience uh, we had not that long, my husband and I had not that long ago uh, in, uh, in Belgium. Uh, we were in a fabulous museum. Many of you may have been there. It was called the Museum of Musical Instruments. Mm -hmm. Extraordinary. An experience for people of all ages, interests, and levels of achievement. And it was in the most exquisite Art Deco building. 
as were a number of other museums. Why was that, we inquired. Well, this was a project of the federal government's Department of Betterment. So when the department store chain went belly up, they said, these are beautiful buildings. Uh, what can we do to better the whole? And I'm telling you guys, comment. I think that's just a, it's so relevant at, at the smallest community level and potentially at the largest level. It's a, the question of the common good and betterment doesn't seem to surface enough, and yet it's elevating and not a grim question to ask. So if any of you... You know, our, our project is, I think, a, you know, a good one to think about that question in. I mean, um, I think that, you know, Kate, DCA is obliged to um, analyze this project in terms of economic development. I mean, that's just sort of the reality of this city. But in fact, I don't think that's why you guys are in it. I think you guys are in it because you recognize that it's a phenomenal incubator for people who are not having their opportunity to show their work, work on their work anywhere else in the city or anywhere else in, you know, in the borough. And, you know, it, I think it is this... Ooh, that might be me. Um, <laughs> um, you know, and I, and I think that there, there's that, you know, I, I, I'm going to turn it over to you, Kate, see if, I'm, see if I'm right. I mean, there's this sort of qualitative, this is why we want to do this versus this is the reality of the way people think about the arts in this city. I think that's part of it, but I think the big scary thing is I, you guys would be terrified if there was a Department of Betterment in the United States because my better wouldn't be your better. No, I, you you really would Sounds because no, I mean it, it, that's I, I think that's sort of it, what both of you make such a profound case for in your two books about this period is the ways in which people took the depression personally and felt a sense of shame and a sense of failure and you know to the extent that the arts were able to address that or struggle with that issue you know that's uh, that is to their credit but i do think we live in a country where there's a profound suspicion of anyone trying to deliver a totalizing sense of what's important. So obviously, well, not obviously, the reason the city of New York invests so heavily in culture is because we do think of it as beneficial in lots of different ways. But how you articulate that benefit has to be, you, know, you, you have to hit a bunch of different criteria. It can't just be, because I really like the theater that Leslie produces, because I can promise you three people sitting next to me don't. So there has to be another another set of standards. The idea, though, would be interdisciplinary. Mm -hmm. So the better sure. of, of the whole, like Mr. Mm -hmm. Anthony was talking before about collaborating mm -hmm. with the public. Well, why don't the heads of all these sit down and say, you know, what are the common mm -hmm. areas of interest of betterment rather mm -hmm. than going the parallel tracks? Well, I mean, it, certainly in New York, we, we very much try and do that. Yeah. And I think, well, you know, we do it a fair amount. Um, yeah. one, but, one of the main hallmarks of this administration is that the agencies, the, the federal agencies are to collaborate with each other, not just exist in their silos doing their own particular thing, and I think that's happening. Next question. Uh, something that you folks touched on earlier that I would like to return to briefly has to do with the ferocity of the opposition to the WPA and its uh, moment in history, and if we could maybe relate that to something we touched on earlier regarding the stimulus and so forth, and let me just give you a specific example of uh, something I want to talk about. In the last three or four weeks, I've seen three or four articles about percent for art programs, so uh, one in Nebraska for example, 50 or 40 million dollar building and 1% of that expenditure needs to be uh, applied to some sort of uh, artistic contribution. Uh, in the uh, state legislature, there was a, a, a quote in this newspaper article from a legislator saying, well, we have this terrible deficit, we need to address it, we don't need this art. It's not the only uh, article I've come across, as I say, in the last three or four weeks dealing with that. Uh, Given the ferocity of the opposition in its moment to the WPA, as I say, and given that there was such fer ferocious opposition to the $50 million stimulus, what can those of us working in, supporting, incentivized by, motivated by the value of the creative economy do better with our messaging? How do we refute the argument that we don't need this art? Just looking as a percent for art as an example. What can we collectively or individually do better? I'll sit down now. <laughs> I think it's a great question, and I wish yeah. you know more people would ask it. I think you'd, the thing that people don't like about arts funding is 
differs wildly from individual to individual. You know, it can be a code for issues about race, about class, about economics, about neighborhood. But, you know, on the one hand, I try to look at it as, you know, a sincere form of flattery. People think that they know and can make evaluative judgments about the arts, and therefore they are expert. You know, the military budget doesn't get challenged. The highway budget doesn't get challenged the way the arts budget gets challenged because there's a sense that everybody is an expert. So I do think, you know, in talking with your neighbors, your colleagues, you know, opinion makers, potential funders, the key thing to ask is if you're resistant, why? And really hear it. Because I think, you know, there, there's a sense in the arts, we all, you know, we were on the side of the angels. Why don't people appreciate it? There's a sense that everybody, yeah, your, your opinion about an artistic work is as valid as anybody yeah. else's. S.J. Perlman had a great line. He said, I don't know much about medicine, but I know what I like. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. That's great. But, but, you, but, you ha- but you have to know what you're trying to refute or convert and not just assume that you do. Look, because the argument is that it would say $63,000 mm-hmm. would be this tiny little drop in the, in the deficit. Mm-hmm. For, sorry for the follow-up. Right. And so it's really not about the, the deficit. In this no, it's, it, it's state. not. It's about something else. But, but, but so, so, then, so, so then it's about, you know, depending on the piece in question, uh, what do you make of the fact that if it's a homeless intake shelter, uh, children and families sit more quietly for a five-hour period of time if they're in a beautiful space? Right. You know, so, but, but depending on, you, you really have to push people to upcheck what they're afraid of before you can figure out how to respond to it. I this think, may not I be think I'm a... Next, uh, sir? Yeah, this is the next. I sorry. Think I'm, oh, I'm sorry. Yeah. Yeah. You, and then you. Um, I have, uh, Who are you? My, my name is Marco Viscusi, and I uh, Hi. was I for many husband. years president of Poets House and involved in some other arts organizations. Um, I have two very different questions. One is for Mr. Landisman, and I know um, I, I knew your predecessor, Dana Joyer, quite well because he's a poet, and um, he was very proud of the fact that the, that the NEA had its own programs. In other words, didn't just support other artists across the country, but started, for instance, the writing programs with the military or Shakespeare for military bases and so on. I wondered whether you, how you felt about that. It was controversial in the arts um, community and uh, whether you're going to continue that. And then the other question is, for those of you who are experts on the history, um, how about the 50s when the State Department used the arts um, in the Cold War? Very important. And um, what kind of legacy did that leave, and do we ever want to see that again? (laughs) Well, I'll take the first one, and you can take the second one. Um, Those programs uh, are being continued by us. with some um, mixed feelings on my part, the, the programs are very unpopular in the in the field, and not terribly popular am- among the uh, NEA discipline directors, because they are perceived as taking money out of the field. That money that would be going to uh, artists and arts organizations directly are now going to national NEA uh, NEA programs, and so it's a uh, it's a, it's a two-edged sword. Some of those programs, like the Big Read, are very, very popular, particularly 